Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Applejack pulled pork buns. That's right, we are using apple juice and whiskey to produce one of my favorite versions of pulled pork, which by the way, we're not pulling. It's more of a smashing. And speaking of smashed, the name comes from the fact that this was originally made with Jack Daniels, but you can use any whiskey you want, like I did, or none at all, which I'll explain later. But for now, let's go ahead and get started by cutting up our pork. And what we want here is about a two and a half pound piece of pork shoulder, which to confuse people is sometimes sold as pork butt. And what we're shooting for here is about a two inch chunk, which is easy to do if you slice off about a two inch piece, and then cut that into a strip about two inches wide. And then if you turn it and cut across every two inches, according to our calculations, you will get about a two inch chunk. And no, it doesn't have to be exact. Just get it close. That's all we ever ask. And by the way, some recipes would work out just fine if you didn't use pork shoulder and instead used a different cut, but this is not one of them. We need something that has a relatively high fat content, and if you were to use something like a pork loin, this would not even come out remotely the same. And then once we have that cut up as shown, we'll go ahead and transfer that into our stew pot, and we can start adding the rest of the ingredients, which will include some diced onion, and I'm using red because that's what I had, but whatever you have will work. And we'll also want a good amount of freshly minced garlic. And then as far as our seasonings go, we will do some kosher salt, with the rule of thumb being about one teaspoon per pound of meat. We'll also do some freshly ground black pepper, plus some smoked paprika, to pay homage to traditional pulled pork, which of course is done with smoked pork shoulder. And then we'll finish up with a few shakes of cayenne for good luck. At which point it's time to add our liquids, which if you're going by the title should include some Jack Daniels, but I went with a locally made bourbon, because I'm that guy. But any whiskey will work. And then for the apple, we want to do some apple cider vinegar, as well as some apple juice or apple cider. And once that's in, we can head to the stove, and we'll place this over high heat and give everything a stir. And by the way, I went with three cups of apple juice, which will produce a fairly sweet final product. So if you don't want it as sweet, you could do two cups of apple and one cup of water or one and a half, one and a half, or one apple, two water. But I went with 100% pure apple juice, and it was fantastic. In any event, as I said, we'll go ahead and place that on high heat, and we will wait for this to come up to a simmer. And once it does, we'll go ahead and give it another stir, at which point we can back our heat down to low, and we'll cover this, and we will simmer it covered for about two hours or so, or until the meat is fork tender, which could take an hour and a half, it could take two and a half hours, Okay, that will depend on the exact size of your pork pieces. So there's really no way to tell by time, but we can tell, of course, by giving it the old polka polka with a fork. And when that slides in with little to no effort, we know we've cooked it long enough. And right here, I could tell mine was perfect. And once it is, we'll go ahead and grab our spider, and we will transfer the meat into a bowl. And by the way, if you don't have one of these tools that every kitchen should have, you'll have to use like a slotted spoon or tongs, and you're only going to be able to grab one or two pieces at a time. Whereas with the spider, you can grab like five or six or seven pieces, which is so much faster. I mean, do the math. So what I'm trying to say is make sure you have one of those in your kitchen. And then what we'll do is just set our meat aside temporarily while we turn our heat back up to medium high, since we want to reduce these cooking liquids by about 75%. And please don't measure. We're just going by eye. Oh, and if you want to skim some of that fat off the top, this would be the time. But since I want this to be as rich and succulent as possible, I'm not going to remove any. All right, I paid for that fat, and I'm going to eat that fat. But of course, suit yourself. I mean, you are, after all, the Reese Witherspoon, a removing grease with a spoon. And this will still be very nice if you do, just not quite as unctuous. And then what we'll do once those liquids are reduced down to our liking is reduce our heat back down to low, and we'll go ahead and stir in our reserve pork, at which point we'll take a potato masher, or as we call it in this recipe, a pork masher, and we'll go around and we'll break that pork up into nice small shreddy pieces. And if you're wondering, why did you stir the pork in when you were gonna mash it and stir it anyway? Well, that is a very good question to which I have no answer. Oh, and another thing you might be wondering about was why we didn't brown the pork and onions, which we could have done, since browning meat always adds a little more savoriness and flavor. But this stuff is gonna be so flavorful that it really doesn't make any significant difference so I thought I would save you a step. And once our pork's been broken up, we will cook this stirring on low for a couple minutes, 
to make sure that meat's heated through and is absorbing all that beautiful sauce. And at this point, we could be done if we want. Okay, all we would need to do is taste this to make sure the seasoning's right. And don't be surprised if it needs a little bit of salt. And once we were happy with it, we could go ahead and serve it up. But I'm not going to serve mine now, since I think this is significantly more delicious if we let it cool down and then cover it and pop it in the fridge overnight and then reheat it and serve it the next day. So that is exactly what I did. And 18 hours later, I went ahead and placed that on medium heat to warm it back up. And by letting it sit overnight and then reheating it like this, I really do believe we achieve peak texture and flavor. So to summarize, if you can include an extra day in the production, I do think it comes out significantly better. And that's it once that's been reheated. And maybe those cooking liquids have reduced a little more. I like to turn off the heat and stir in some freshly sniffed chives. And you could, if you want, also use green onions or maybe some herbs if you want. So I stirred those in and then I went ahead and served this up which I'm going to do on this top secret experimental sesame bun inspired by the steamed bow style buns. And I am still perfecting the recipe, so I'm not going to show you how to make that yet. But I think it has great potential, so stay tuned for updates as they become available. But anyway, I piled up my Applejack pulled pork high and proud, and then I finished this by topping it with a very mustardy, very acidic coleslaw featuring cabbage and peppers. Because if you're going to serve something that's hot and soft and kind of sweet, the perfect pairing would be something that's cold and crunchy and kind of sour. All right, as I said a million times, cooking is contrast. And that's it, my Applejack pulled pork bun was ready to enjoy. And that, my friends, was just a magnificent sandwich. Okay, as I already mentioned, that apple juice and bourbon definitely give the pork a sweet flavor, but it's a very savory, earthy type of sweetness, which I think works perfectly here, especially with the aforementioned slaw. And even though technique-wise, we weren't even close to a traditional pulled pork method, the final result, the final mouthfeel, to me at least, is just as good. Okay, I do like a nice traditional pulled pork, but sometimes it is a little too smoky, as well as sometimes maybe a little bit dried out. But here we have no such issues. And using the method you just saw, it is virtually impossible not to end up with something very moist and tender. So even though this is technically a cheater method, I think it checks off all the boxes. Oh, and for whatever reason you don't want to use whiskey, you can simply make this recipe without the booze. And texture-wise, it will come out exactly the same. And flavor-wise, it will come out almost exactly the same. Okay, unless you tried them side by side, it's almost impossible to explain the difference in flavor if you don't put the whiskey in, since it definitely adds something. Or as we used to say back in the day, a little something something. That I guess is a sort of type of sweetness, Right, kind of a deeper caramelized fermented sweetness. Anyway, I'm going to stop trying to describe it. And I just want you to know if you don't add the bourbon, it's not going to wreck the recipe. But if you can add the bourbon, add the bourbon. And even though this was very good on my experimental sesame seed bow inspired bun, this would be equally magnificent on your standard hamburger bun or whatever bun or roll you usually put your pulled pork on. Or if you're one of these keto folks I've read about, I've served this meat just over salad greens, and just between you and me, off the record, it was very, very good. So yes, no bun, still fun. But no matter how you serve yours, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.